like to call the, uh, the City Council Board of Public Works uh, Joint Conference Committee. Uh -huh. It's uh, March 10th, 2014, at 4 o'clock. We're meeting in the Board of Public Works office here. And present are Jesse Adams, Terry Hopefulhane, Elisa? Elisa. Elisa Klein, uh -huh. Michael Parsons, MJ Adams, Ned Huntley, Jim and Terry Yuska. And uh, we have notice from Paul Spector that he'll be unable to attend today. Um, why don't we go ahead? Uh, it doesn't appear that there's anyone here for public comment. So I will move right into the first item for consideration. I'm looking for a motion for the approval of the minutes of October 21st, 2013. Remove approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All staying? Okay, next order of business, um, plowing and potholes, addressing resident concerns. Alicia, 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 oh, just Lisa with an A. Okay, um, I don't have any particular agenda in mind in talking about this, but as you can imagine, it's, um, it's, the, the bulk of calls that I get is about this. Um, with varying degrees of anger, some people calling to say, what can we do as citizens besides just, you know, register the particular pothole. Um, I just wanted to see if we could have some kind of conversation about um, how to talk about this with the residents of Northampton. And, um, you know, as I know you're all well aware, there have been some really angry um, things in the newspaper, as there often are. And so there's there's a little bit of a, um, you know, there's, there's something brewing. And I just um, thought it might be useful for this group to be able to talk about it and um, just discuss how, how you want me as a city councilor to be talking to people about it, um, suggestions. Um, and just get some information from you about how we feel like you are addressing it as the Department of Public Works, the Board of Public Works, and so forth. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I can start if you like. Yeah. Currently we have about a $38 million backlog in paving operations in the city. That includes anything from patching and crack sealing to road reconstruction activities such as mills and overlays or overlays and final uh, the biggest one is probably roadway reclamation projects. Uh, that's been going up for um, a number of years. I believe four years ago it was at 24 million. The city currently only uses Chapter 90 funds to do paving operations in the city of about a million dollars a year. That million dollars also competes with other work that needs to be done, such as hiring engineering firms for roadway improvement projects, traffic signals, uh, some studies that might be done also. So the full million doesn't go into paving and, and street maintenance, also goes to engineering needs also. Um, our pothole budget or our asphalt budget for fixing potholes went from four years ago $25,000 a year to $100,000 a year. Uh, basically the city's inability to program necessary money to be able to do these type of infrastructure improvements. Does that mean you went up that much to because we can't you know, because, because that means that's the substitute for not being able to do that's it. correct so in the past few years the dpw has actually purchased i think it was last year we actually purchased a second hot box machine what we're able to do is during the winter months go out with hot asphalt up to about eight tons on a given day um to be able to fill potholes uh, it's not a lot but um the boxes are thirty thousand dollars a piece we have two of them now running and we prepare for those during the fall by making, um, we call it asphalt ignits. And basically, um, when we want to use the hot box the next day, we throw the out three or four tons in each batch and turn on the heat. And that way we have fresh asphalt the next day to fill potholes. So that's our method of dealing with it in the city. And we have a um, basically a four-man crew that goes out and does it all day long as conditions allow. They go out all day? Yeah. Seven to three. I think I was going to just say to look at it from the other standpoint, from the resident standpoint. If they have concerns, they should make us aware of them. Mm -hmm. 
So if there's a plowing concern right after a storm, street's not clear, icy condition, that sort of thing, we feel a lot of calls like that. Um, and that's one way that we respond, um, because people are aware of situations on the street that may change after a storm. Melting snow, icy condition can call some of the snow. We can dispatch a, uh, a plow truck or a sander, as it were, to try to fix the condition, or um, the end of a street, if there's a snow bank in the way that's um, of, of visual being able to pull out, we can take care of those sorts of things. Same thing with potholes. Obviously, if people see a, a pothole, there's a million of them right now, um, and we get to them as we can, as Ned, Ned has indicated. There's only so much we can do this time of year, um, but certainly knowing where they are and have people um, contacting us with locations and that sort of thing are, um, you know, are important. Um, so that's some of the things they can do if they have concerns beyond sort of uh, something that they can call in and, and make us aware of. Obviously, coming into the Board of Public Works, I've had residents come in and speak to the board about a general method of operation. There's concerns and other things that they want to talk about. Um, clearly, the board um, is more than willing to listen to what people have to say about that. So, it's a little different way of looking at the, the problem rather than from the top down, but from, from a resident standpoint, what they could do. Has there been any discussion of any kind of public information campaign or? Um, just response to the kind of stuff that's been in the public domain and the newspapers and so forth, because um, I'm just wondering if that, um, in your experience, kind of stirs things up or creates it as a real conflict, or you know, is it better to just kind of keep working quietly, or is there, has there ever been a concerted effort, I guess, to do some kind of public information campaign? Not that I'm aware of on potholes. Um, I know the latest conversation or letters the editor were regarding snow removal in downtown, but they weren't. It's going to be cold. Why is that? I didn't touch it. <laughs> they weren't pothole related, if that's what you're referring to. Uh -huh. I think um, we've had some discussions internally. We haven't talked to the board about it. It's probably a good thing that you brought it up. Um, you know, clearly being able to communicate to the residents the services that we provide and how they're provided. Uh, is an important thing. I think in, in some areas we do a pretty nice job at describing what we're doing. Clearly in the plowing this year, uh, questions have come up. Usually when you have a bad winter you get more questions than when you have a winter that's not so snowy. Um, I think the, the, uh, the editorial and the Gazette seem pretty uh, level-handed in terms of uh, there being a need to communicate um, how we operate a little bit more directly for people that are really interested in knowing sort of the level of service that's provided and why we provide that level of service and whether, because that, I, I think it was was pretty decent because they're saying if there, if there are, basically, if there are other ways of, of doing business by investing more in, in snow plowing operations, <coughs> then those are things that could be looked at. So it's, you know, w with everything in life, you get a certain service at a certain price and the city can decide if they don't like the service that's being provided now or they want more done or in a different way and it requires more resources then it would be up to us to define if you paid for a little more resources, more men and equipment or contractors or whatever, what, what the resulting service would be. So I, I think it's a reasonable conversation there at some point. Like I said, we haven't, we haven't circled back to the board yet at this point in order to talk about that, but um, it seems reasonable. Yeah. Just um, to put in a, give you a little more perspective on this, we have almost 150 miles of pavement in the city. Uh, average life of pavement is 10 years, maybe 15 years optimistically, is that roughly accurate? Mm -hmm. So if you do the math, let's say it's 15 years, which is being generous. <coughs> we should be paving 10 miles of roadway every year in order to at least stay even. Uh, in fact, the pr probably the number is a little higher than 10 miles per year. And going back to what Jim said about you to define a level of service depending on what you're willing to spend on it, <coughs> I don't think, do we even, uh, do we occasionally get up to five miles? No. No. Mm -hmm. Not even close. A mile. Yeah. A, a mile. mile. A mile. mile. I mean, it, it's, it's like we're not even on the same planet of, say, keeping up with pavement. Um, and, and that's a direct reflection of what the city's willing to budget on that area. Now, if you don't, if you let a roadway start to collapse, it, it just goes to crap. 
uh, once it, it kind of goes off the cliff. And at that point, fixing it is not a matter of freshening up the pavement a little, you know, another inch of asphalt or something. It means digging the whole thing up and starting over. And uh, okay. more and more of our streets are falling into that category. Okay. So we're pushing this huge ball of expense forward by neglecting it so badly now. Just, it's huge. My comments are relative to snow plowing, not not the paving operation in terms of level of service and that issue. I, under, I understand, okay. but okay. but but the same thing applies. Okay. Well, I, oh. well, I, I, I thank you, Jim. <laughs> and I was going to say, what we do is we try to do these patch jobs. I mean, we we did the crack ceiling to try to keep the pavement, you know, all that little mm -hmm. little pieces of tar that they spray on try to preserve the pavement and make it last longer, but it feels like we're got our finger in the back, quite honestly. And, and it's it's very little. So there's the pothole piece and the second piece is the plowing, the snow snow removal. And inevitably every March we sit around the Board of Public Works and talk about what can we do differently with plowing. Is there a different way we could uh, have parking happen on the streets or not happen on the streets so that we can have more effective use of our fine resources, more efficient use of it. And it's that time of year, and I'm sure we'll be talking about it Wednesday night. <laughs> years ago, not even that many, 30 years ago? Uh, at the beginning of winter, that was it for uh, parking on the street. No parking on the street until spring. And so <coughs> the trucks could very efficiently clean up after every storm. But now, even if it's a bad storm, people can park on the street during the day. So, you know, in my neighborhood, which is a kind of a congested neighborhood off of South Street, you can see where the plow is going around the cars, and it just, it's a mess. And it's hard for the plow drivers. So we have, a, as you probably read, 11 to 12, or 11, 12, 13 highway people who are qualified to drive the big trucks. No, those are the picking crew. Those are the snow cleanup operations people that work the second night okay. and clean up operations off the of main street and the side streets. So there, so once the storm's over, all the contractors go home, all of the people that we've pulled from other divisions go back to their normal jobs. And we have this little crew that does the picking. I talked to the guy who drives, you know the big orange grader you see it going up and down the streets, knocking down the snow banks? He had 170 hours of overtime in his paid period around the two storms, two, two week pay period. 70 hours of overtime? He just basically worked until he dropped and then come back and... <clears throat> Again, I understand that Jim was talking about um, something else, but that's... We're getting the service we're paying for. Just perspective. I mean, I just, you know, so... <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting exactly what we're paying for. Just so also that the city council knows is that uh, for the past number of years I've been asking to do capital improvements each year for a funding source for paving operations. I know the last two years I believe there's a request of $4.5 million each year for five years to take care of some of the backlog. And it's my understanding and reading through the mayor's proposal this year to the city council that there is a Light on them for FY15 of $500,000 to help supplement our paving operations this year. What was your request? $4.5 million. It's $500,000? That's, that's what I told. Yes. And your request is $4.5 million? Yes. And then we'll have our Chapter 90 supplement of $1.02 million, I think it is. So is Chapter 90 going up this year? No, not that I'm aware of. Because we've been making discussion about that bumping up this year. It's been a discussion for a couple of years. 1.02 million, you said? Uh, 1.026, I think it is. I can get you the exact number, Jesse. No, 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 I just want to know. Lisa, does that answer your questions? Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any further discussion on the topic? Um, I guess I just would want to say one additional thing, and 
you know, I'm really new at this, as you all know, so I really don't know kind of what's in the realm of appropriateness for me to even speak about here, but I'm um, just wondering if um, it wouldn't be useful somehow, and I don't know if it needs to come from within DPW, if we need to be talking to the mayor's office, so any feedback you have would be appreciated, but some kind of um, public information campaign I think would be really useful so that there is a sense that DPW is responding to this, these concerns. Even if it is, you know, um, you can interest, uh, you know, Chad Kane or someone else from the Gazette to um, write a story about what the costs are, how many people are out, um, you know, just something along those lines. And maybe I'm totally naive. Again, I have a lot of caveats here because I am new at this. But I get the sense that it could go a long way in um, just giving people in Northampton some information about what's happening so that they're not just kind of building up these kind of fantastical, um, you know, angry opinions about what isn't getting done and, and the reasons why it's not getting done. So, um, you know, I'm happy to hear anything you have to say in response to that. <laughs> so, <coughs> suppose we brought to the council at the end of the snow season, a proposal for increasing the budget around some specific issues. For example, picking the snow down. Is that something that would be possible? We'd have to hi probably hire additional contractors exactly. to do that work. Yeah. So, so, but we put it to the council. Here's a proposal. We could pick the snow. It's going to cost eighty-five thousand dollars or one hundred eighty, whatever the number is. Would the mayor have to budget that himself? Suspending snow and ice. Yeah. This well, is this is one of the problems that we have is that the city has never trued up its snow and ice account. They've always relied on deficit spending. Uh, typically, a, a decent winter is seven to eight hundred thousand dollars in cost. And last year, we uh, uh, the mayor put an additional hundred thousand dollars into that budget, so we're up to four hundred twenty-six thousand now. But it's still about. 40, 45% shy of what it should be on a regular basis. So when we move forward in the new fiscal year, we already know that based on our past experience, we're only getting about 60% of what we really need to cover next year's budget allocated in the current budget. That's correct. And then after the fact, they come in and they backfill with reserves. Of That's correct. And my, it's my understanding is one of the only, if only few accounts that you can deficit spend with the council approval in the city budget. That, that illegal going to. So w would that be of interest, a proposal for? Yeah. Or at least during the budget hearings that the city has to say, you know, let's, this is the true number. Mm -hmm. But the true number only gets us to the level of service we provided this year, which was deemed inadequate. <coughs> I think there's a certain mystery about what we do. Maybe part of it is describing to people what it is that we do and why we do uh, plowing and snow clearing the way we do it. I mean, that's a really basic type of thing. If you talk to Richie, I've asked Richie many times about different aspects of the operation and why we do things, if there's a different way we can do it. There are a lot of reasons why we do things the way we do, and it's quite complicated. But educating people as to why certain things happen the way they do, I think would, you know, that alone would be a good thing in addition to these, you know, Terry's idea of providing a, you know, an option in terms of level of service. Of course, the cost in any given year is going to be a function of the, you know, the snow. You know, we worked really hard with the, um, the, the stormwater ordinance to have these, you know, the meetings and all the wards and all that kind of stuff, and I'm not suggesting we do <coughs> ward meetings about paving and snow removal, but you know, there's something in the spirit of that that, you know, at least we can say, we can turn to residents and say, we've been doing these meetings and, and you know, this is where you get the information, this is where we get your feedback. Um, and I think that people are frustrated that they don't have that, you know, yes, they can call dispatch when there's a mound of snow that they can't see around, but, you know, they see that as this kind of isolated incident and they don't have that, I think, clear picture, like you're saying, Jim, of <coughs> what goes on, why it goes on, how it goes on how many hours people are working, all of those kinds of things. So that's that's kind of what I was trying to get at. And there might be a way of doing that through city council by, 
even just submitting a proposal, so there's some discussion about it, but I think that more of a kind of real community outreach kind of public information kind of piece could be very useful. Shall we take it up with the Board of Public Works on the agenda? Or forward it to the, the board for consideration? Sure. Any other discussion on the bottom? Okay. So we'll move on and talk about watershed forestry management. Jim. Um, I put this on the agenda um, just to acknowledge to the council was that we realized that you've been copied on emails from um, from a local resident who's upset that uh, we're cutting trees down in the city's watershed property. Um, and I wanted to offer to any of the councilors if they uh, want to know more about the program that. Um, the forestry management programs that we're managing here at Public Works, we're happy to meet and provide information. We've set up a website of uh, information on the Public Works website that has copies of forest, forest stewardship plans and other information about uh, ongoing activities in the watershed. So I just wanted to let you know that we're, we're aware that someone is, is not pleased and we're also uh, just wanted to make you aware that there's information available if you want to bring yourself up to speed or if you want to talk to me, I'm happy to, to meet or have a conversation in more detail. Could you respond briefly to his concerns because I've, I've agreed at his urging to go <coughs> do it at his, on a site visit tomorrow. So I'd, I'd like to hear from you before I hear from him. Property is posted for no trespassing. Oh, it is? Okay, he told me. Okay, I, I, that's one of the things I said to him. I said, I said I'll go, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm not getting charged with trespassing for this. Mm -hmm. He said it's, it's public land, so it's not? It, it's public land posted for no trespassing. Okay. What does that mean? It means you can't walk on the land unless you have the city's approval to walk on the land. And how do you go about getting that? You would contact the Department of Public Works and ask if you could walk on the land. Well, who, the board or the director? It would be or the, the director or myself. Can I go on public land tomorrow to look at the watershed? What time are you going on the public land tomorrow? Uh, I think it's four. four, five, four, five. A couple of councils, a uh, number of us are. It's yeah. Bill and me and you and I think one other person. Mm -hmm. So you're welcome to, to take a walk. Um, we're um, we're going to be posting tomorrow on, on our website um, a sort of a photographic update. So we have some technical information there. We have um, back in 2012, um, the city prepared forest, forest stewardship plans for the property that we own in the watershed. And in those forest stewardship plans, it outlined certain activities that were going to happen over a 10-year period in order to uh, improve the resiliency of the forest. So there's, um, there's a lot of information there. It's sort of technical, and it could be a lot to read. If you want to, if you want to dive into it, you're welcome to do that. One of the things that we did is we put together this document, which is basically a series of photographs um, not unlike the one that you received from Mr. Matero, with the exception of our captions are a little bit more descriptive about um, the types of activities that we're doing and what the why it looks like it looks and what we're trying to accomplish by uh, by the logging. Um, there's a lot of sort of inflammatory language um, that's been sent around by email. Most of it we feel isn't accurate. We're not really doing clear cutting or commercial logging. We're doing very selective thinning and removing of certain trees. Um, I think the largest area that we've opened within the watershed is about a third of an acre. Um, the majority of the watershed, we're, uh, we're actually won't be doing any logging work in. But um, you're also welcome to walk the property with us. We've had we've done a fair amount of outreach with um, neighbors and the butters and the general public. We've had two forestry walks. We had one in the fall before we started any uh, logging activity so we could meet with people and walk the property and describe what the activities were that were planned. And then we had a, a subsequent um, public walk back in February, on the 15th of February, where during the course of the logging activity, we brought residents, abutters, anybody that wanted to see what we were doing, welcome to come out and take a look and we described um, the activities that were happening. Um, those are pretty well attended. Um, and I think once people understand the things that we're trying to do, they're actually quite limited in terms of forestry management programs. Um, but you'll take a look tomorrow with um, uh, with the resident and, and or whenever you happen to be going out, and you can get a look at what it is. Um, if you want to do a comparable walk with us and the city's consulting forester, we're happy to do that really at any point. 
you're going to hear two different viewpoints. Um, uh, Mr. Matera, who's been complaining about what we're doing, I don't. He's never really called with any specific questions about what we're doing, other than I think he doesn't think that any tree should ever be cut down. I think it's his viewpoint, um, and we have what we consider reasonable justifications for managing the watershed land in the way that we're doing that's consistent with other watershed managers throughout New England. Um, so we're not doing something that's sort of outside industry standard practice or um, anything that would not be considered recommended um, in the world of watershed management for public water supply. So I wanted to make that, uh, just sort of make that general announcement and um, we do have plenty of information available um, to help you understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. So it's on the DPW website now, this, what you just showed us? The this like will copy. be on there tomorrow. The city's been having website problems today with a little tool that allows us to post documents. But uh, I think it's supposed to be fixed tonight. we will be able to put this up online tomorrow. Um, so you can take a look. Um, I imagine you know, but um, I received from a number of Ward 7 residents because uh, something went up. We have a a neighborhood listserv, it's not even a word, it's not a non-political listserv of just, you know, activities in, uh, on Yankee Hill and Leeds, and um, somebody, one of the residents posted something about it, and there was a whole uproar, and I got a number of emails, people saying, you know, what's up with this, and what can you tell us, and mm -hmm. so if there is something on the DQ sure. website that I can refer people to as a kind of counterpoint. Sure. Um, it would be really useful. So as soon as that's up, I'd like to let people know yeah. about it. I'll let you know. I mean, I think it's good for people to be educated mm -hmm. about what we're doing. Um, it's interesting that um, when you go to the when you go to the individual's website, one of his big um, arguments is that commercial logging is always done as a way to make money. People always do it to make money, and there's dollar signs and you know things and. And it's ironic because we need the public records request and ask us for all our information about contracts um, and the work that we're, and the, the, the money that we've spent on, on watershed management. At this point, it's about $100,000 in the hole for the overall program. And I think that just goes to show that the approach to watershed management in this particular case is related to the best management of the watershed land um, in terms of our forest stewardship plans. In other words, we're not, we're not out there just cutting trees for the sake of making money and cutting trees, which seems to be his primary, he's argued his primary rationale that he claims people <coughs> cut trees down is to make money. In this particular case, the fact that we haven't, we, we could make money, the city could clearly make money by cutting down a lot of trees that are worth, you know, that valuable trees that are out there. And a lot of those trees we haven't cut down because it's not part of our ultimate goal for improving the watershed land. So, um, you know, it's just one, one particular component of his argument that I think falls a little bit flat. Did I hear you say that commercial contracts have been, um, over the last year, have been about $100,000 worth? So there has been commercial... There have been two contracts. Two contracts. Right. And totaling $100,000? No, $100,000 is the amount of money that the program is in the red. In other words, the city has spent $100,000 managing the watershed forest land. The city actually gets paid by the numbers here. So we've awarded two contracts for logging, and the sum of those contracts Hearing for timber sales was about $46,000. So we were, the city was paid about $46,000 for wood products that were removed from the watershed land. <clears throat> Part of the reason that there's such a disparity, I mean, we're not really approaching it like we spend 150 to get 50. But hiding in that 150 is a comprehensive 10 year plan for watershed management, plus a smaller piece related to all the preparation work for the two contracts that were let out. So, so, it is, so we do have commercial contracts, but, that doesn't, but we're not making money. That is correct. And the programs, the four stewardship plans that we prepared were reviewed and approved by the Department of Conservation and Recreation at the state level. Um, forest cutting plans that, that we use are also approved by the state. And DCR has also awarded us about $42,000 in grant money to implement actions that are um, contained within the forest stewardship plans. 
So it's fairly regulated work. Um, and as a longtime member of our board, <coughs> what we're doing now with Nicole Sanford and Jim's work is just light years more advanced than what we did back in the 90s. I mean, some of his criticisms might have been more appropriate back then, but what we're doing now is far more thoughtful and uh, the planning is more developed. Who is Nicole Sanford? She's the environmental scientist. scientist. She's a public works employee. What, is, is it okay? Do you guys not mind if we, if we do that visit tomorrow? Mm -hmm. I mean, Welcome. No, no. Thank you. Any further discussion on this item? All right, let's move forward. Number three, selection of the new committee chair. Um, every year we get to switch off. This past year was the Board of Public Works turn to be the chair of the committee. I got to sit in that seat and it's now time to hand the torch over to City Council. So we're looking for City Council uh, members to uh, take the leadership role with the committee chair this next year. I nominate Paul Spector. That's what I was say. Not because he's actually. I second that. <laughs> <laughs> he can't protest. <laughs> but he actually, he actually would like to. Yeah, great. Excellent choice. Oh, I second it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Um, update status report on private ways. Uh, we have actually 34 private ways under review. Field work's been complete, research has been complete on 27 of those ways. We have draft plans completed on 24 of those ways. Uh, descriptions completed and sent to Alan Seawall, the city solicitor for review, is 19 of those ways. And um, we actually have mylars that are waiting for orders of taking from the city solicitor for three of those. So, kind of status update, we're getting down there. We've had a few stragglers coming in, like ones we didn't expect, Foggy Meadow Road, Cook Avenue, a few others here and there, new subdivision road, Ridgeview, that we're seeing in two weeks. So, um, there's a little more growth than 34, but we're getting through all, through all of them on a fairly quickly basis. I, hoping that all the survey work will be done by spring and hopefully it's just a summer session through city council getting them all accepted. Any discussion? Thank you. Next item stormwater management and flood control. Terry and Jessica. <coughs> it, it, it went very well I thought uh, Thursday night. Um, the uh, the legal challenges were a little bit last moment, um, but I, I thought everyone seemed to. So Alan Seawall came up with some last moment. I read something in the paper about it. Concerns <coughs> about the language. For example, um, we've talked about a cap, mm -hmm. and he was very gracious to admit that he was both tardy and he had missed a few things, um, but. He said, really, we were not allowed to have a cap. Uh, he did, however, rewrite it such that the Board of Public Works can't propose a budget in excess of $2 million unless we have very specific reasons for that. Um, as far as the City Council having approval or not, they've always had approval over a budget. So there are a number of changes like that. And they, they were a little, there's some hand wringing about the changes given the late, the late timing. But as I say, I thought he, he was fairly gracious about accepting the blame and apologizing. I, I was really pleased that he went through with that unanimously. Well, I, um, through no fault of the BPWs at all, I was disappointed with Solicitor Seawald. And the reason why is because, um, for one, that the the um, the idea that the, the fees would not get raised at all for the first five years, that's been a recommendation since the task force made its recommendations. And I wanted to, and I did go ahead and draft an additional cap that I think everybody's familiar with. 
last probably September. So um, to wake up to that email on the day of the first vote was very disappointing. Um, and and not just because he, it should have happened earlier, it's actually one of the most important roles a solicitor has is being at the ordinance committee and approving the form and legal character of every measure that's going to go to the city council. So the city council is going to vote on something that's legal. He didn't show up to the ordinance committee. Never heard from him. Um, not an ordinance anymore, but I was there. He didn't even show up. So, um, well, I was extremely disappointed. And, quite, and, and I'm, I, I'm happy that it exists now in, in, a, in a different form that's you know permissible by DOR. So I'm, I'm happy about that. And he did take responsibility. He told me directly, you know, I'm sorry, I wasn't, I, wasn't, I didn't mean to, you know, this wasn't intended. And I absolutely, I absolutely take him at his word. Um, but I'm still kind of surprised that it's, okay, it, I'm still kind of surprised in a way that it's legal for the BPW to put this limitation at the count, that on the mayor that the council can. I don't understand why that would be permitted. So that confuses me slightly. Um, we've had all these talks about indirect costs. And, um, and then at the last moment, the solicitor made another rec made, made another proposed change for indirect cost to be the minimum what the OR um, requires, and you know that's been another ongoing conversation. And he was you know a little, a little late for dance on. And also the other thing that concerned me was um, the credit policy. We were voting on the on, the, on my amendment to the credit policy, which basically says um, the DPW will set the the, the, the policy. My, my 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 small amendment was that um, the council can also make changes to the credit policy. And then the solicitor got up and said, no, no, the city council can't order the executive branch to do anything. That's illegal. The city council orders the executive branch to create the credit policy. It's an order in the, in, in the order. So I just, maybe it was too late at night or something, but I don't even know what he's talking about saying we can't do that. We do things like that all the time. Um, um, so, I mean, that, that to me was absolutely an error, um, which I'm going to talk to him about and probably, and, and for me, I, I, I want to change that amendment just because I don't think that we lack the authority, but I don't think it's clear anymore. Like, I mean, how would that work? You guys can create it and we can change it, but how? Who have, you know, what, I mean, that just, like, it seems like a creative conflict. Like, do we just create our own and you guys create our own the two out there? So, so I think what I'd like to do is just delete the entire <coughs> amendment. And if the city council wants to, it can change the ordinance so that I mean this probably never happened, but I mean I mean theoretically, if the city council city council wants to, it can change the ordinance so that we create the credit policy, you know. But um, but also the, the solicitor wanted to that the mayor could amend the credit policy along with the city council. And that with me doesn't make any sense either. The BPW is the mayor. The BPW is part of the executive branch. The BPW is appointed by the mayor. The director is appointed by the mayor. The, the members are appointed by the mayor subject to our um, ratification. So maybe it's just too late at night or something, but I don't, I don't know why he felt that it was necessary to have that language in there. I mean, for, I mean if you think about it as, as by way of analogy, um, the planning board does site plan approvals. The mayor doesn't. The mayor can't at some point say, no, nah, no, no, forget about what the planning board wants. I want this to happen. That can't happen. So I think I might just amend that to... Um, to cut that out, that out entirely. Um, aside from that, I mean, I, 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 I think, I think it was a good discussion, um, and uh, I think there were some good amendments in there. So, I actually am getting a good amount of feedback now that's between readings. Um, you know, ranging from, you know concerned about process to those who don't like it, which obviously there are those who don't like it, but that's that. Um, but other than that, the, I, um, now that we're on second reading, I think it was a good discussion, and um, those are my thoughts. Mike? Could the credit policy be subject to city council approval? <coughs> Is that is that a way you could That's get, a good get to what you want to do? That's it. Good, good proposal. 
I would think so. I mean, the, I mean, I mean, we're going to be voting on we're going to be voting on the rates, right? Subject to your mm -hmm. approval, still. Mm -hmm. So that's that's yeah. I'll, I'll present. I, I might go, I might mm -hmm. present that idea. I'll steal that idea from you. You can tell me. What's the thinking behind? <coughs> it seems it seems like a kind of a an arcane bit of policy. To it's hard to imagine the city council reaching in and saying, "No, I think rain barrel should be a fifteen dollar credit." What can you can you imagine a situation where the oh well <coughs> well I mean yeah I mean I I I, I would think that. Um, the city council, if he delegates it, he delegates it entirely, I mean, well, at least in this ordinance, and I would just think that there would be situations where we might want to, I, mean, I think the credit policy, I read it, I think it's very good, and there's, 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 it's very inclusive, and it's, 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 um, there's, there's more than I even would have guessed to it. Um, there are a lot of different categories of, of, um, of credits. Um, so, but before I ever saw it, I thought that there, I just foresaw maybe there'd be a situation where, um, you know, that there'd be some reasonable credit that's not, that's that the BBW considers just not in there and the council may yeah. want to add. Um, so. We see it as being a uh, kind of a living document. I mean, people are going to come to us with ideas that we have not thought of. Mm -hmm. Other ideas we do have may not work well the way it was originally implemented. Um, so I, I, I see it as something that would change over time. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? No. Very pleased. Um, next agenda item is Pulaski Park. Jim. I uh, just wanted to let the councils know that I'm in the process of. Uh, establishing dates for three public meetings for um, to receive public input about the design for Pulaski Park renovations. So a couple months ago, the uh, Community Preservation Preservation Community Preservation Act Committee awarded a grant for the design of uh, renovations to the park. Um, we're looking at starting probably uh, the latter part of April. Um, but I'll send a flyer out to everybody, try to get the word out and get people interested in coming out to these design meetings um, so that they can let their thoughts be known about what they want the park to look like. So you'll be getting an email from me once that flyer is drafted, hopefully later this week. So the meeting you're in anticipated on April 3rd isn't going to happen? No, the, um, Stephen Stimson, who's the lead landscape architect, had a um, sort of a tragic death in his family, so he called and asked um, to delay by three weeks to start, so the April 3rd meeting has been canceled, and we're going to hold the April 24th meeting as the first one, and then I'm trying to confirm the date on the end for the last one, which would be sometime in June. Um, that's the end of the agenda. Typically, we go around and ask anybody if they have anything else they want to say. Good, Mike. I'm good. No? I'm all set. Thank you. Jim. All set. Okay. I'm good. Jesse. All set. Thank you. All set. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next meeting is April 14th. Usually the second Monday of the month at 4 o'clock. And can somebody tell Paul that he'll be sharing it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move we adjourn. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>